a free society cannot help the many who are poor. It cannot save the few who are rich. Passionate, committed, and enigmatic. It's humanity. There are very few people that I've met in my life. I mean, he is so kind. He's such a very generous person. You know, you go into the campaign rally and you say, you say to Okufuero, pick up this child for the cameras. He won't do it. Whilst I disagree with the court's decision, I accept it. I accept that what the court says brings finality to the election dispute. By the power vested in me as the chairperson of the Electoral Commission and the returning officer for the presidential election, it is my duty and my privilege to declare Nana Adodankwa Akufuado as the president-elect of the Republic of Ghana. I, Nana Adodankwa Akufu Ado. Having been elected to the high office of president of the Republic of Ghana, having been elected to the high office of the president of the Republic of Ghana, My father actually made him read so much. He says he doesn't mind if it's com comics. He says he should read trash. He should read serious books. He should read everything. When we were all uh, out also and allowed to go and play, and that was made to read and read and read. Sometimes you'd walk into his room and to make the posture of the reading easier for him, he'd have his, both his legs up on the wall, lying on the bed, uh, reading. And uh, actually, my sister and I used to feel sorry for him. <laughs> Time of the one only in 1947. Now, my driver gave me down, Doctor gave me down, late. And now, the papa, a friend of the great, a good father. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, President, the Kurakakara, Sermonia. Forty-seven, ah, uh, forty-seven. You come here, ti. We go for Adon, your papa. You see, you do that go for Adon. You are a lawyer. And then you see your children hospital. So I love my whole baby. I was born in Swalaba. My father had moved to Betsy House at the time when all the big events took place. So 1948 was some of my very first memories. They coincided or they, uh, they were made by the 28th February riots. Mm. Um, they took place just before I was four years old. Wow. Yes. And I remember that was like a turning point in my life because there were so many people who were coming in out of the house, my father, Grandpa Dankwa, Uncle Chebi, all of them moving around, going out, coming in. And I knew something really dramatic had occurred. Um, even though I was a little four-year-old, I could, I could feel it. Yeah. And um, very excited. I was yeah. very, very excited about the events. And 
also thinking that somehow or other, whatever it was that uh, my father mm. was doing, which brought this excitement and all these people, was something that uh, I would like to do. I believe that the source of Nana's confidence was during our youth, the, the, the six pillars that Ghana, the modern Ghana state were built on, were part of our lives. They were in our house the whole time, uh, talking uh, about colossal uh, movements. And uh, as a young lad, he, he was interested uh, in these people and uh, he became their young friend. He was always walking in and out. Of, um, of their meetings and uh, I think he developed his passion and his strength from that. We first met at the Accra Sports Stadium. I was then uh, the, the captain of Ghana Academic House, playing for Ghana Republicans. So we were having a training session at the Accra Sports Stadium. And he had just arrived from England, I think. Yeah, from, from England. And his uncle, one Gadis Ben there, Ofurata, brought him to the stadium you know, to train, to, pra to, to practice. He was a young guy who wanted to play football. So he was made to play with us. And, uh, and uh, he was obviously enamored with the, the type of football I was playing. And he wanted, you know, and it was during, at that time that uh, Ohinija himself, because of his uh, styles, named him Bob Negro. He was a footballer himself. He played for the Republicans as a, in the youth, in his youth. And my support for the pre premiership is Tottenham Hospital. And so is his. He's, he's a great supporter of Tottenham Hospital. So there too we find ourselves in the same boat. When he came back from school in the holidays, Ohenijan encouraged him and wanted him actually to join the Black Stars. So he did come home one day and uh, declared that um, he wanted to stop all his studies and become a footballer. In a prep school in England, I, I boxed. Wow. I stopped then. But I continued to play the other sports, mm -hmm. cricket, football, soccer, and squash. Well, there was a period when I was the national squash champion in Ghana here. No way. No kidding. Yeah, really? in the seventies. Yeah. I, he watches cricket a lot. I see him watch cricket. I sometimes it amuses me how he enjoys it. He's a village boy from Fufu, so cricket is very foreign to me. But he he, he can get glued to his cricket. He gets glued to all the sporting um, activities, football. Um, um, there's actually another one I've forgotten. But but he watches uh, sporting events a lot. When a champion decided to do the Unigov, I remember he came and we were all very upset by the fact that he wanted to turn a military regime into a so-called democratic puppet regime. And uh, he was outraged and told me that they were going to organize that time he'd come to settle in Ghana. I was still practicing my economics uh, commodities in, in London and uh, assured me that he was going to do anything, everything possible with the forces which were resisting that. So in London I heard him do the uh, grapevine that he was doing this and then I was very, very proud of what he was doing. At that time, what was in Ghana for him? You got a lucrative job in Europe. Your father's government has been overthrown by a military regime. Yet, he dropped all of that. Government was overthrown in 72. By 74, 75, 74, he had dropped all of that to relocate and to be part of the leadership for the struggle against military dictatorship. I mean, it, to me, that, if like, sums up his patriotism and his selflessness. Because you, know, you, he sacrificed his self-interest 
for the greater good. And since then, he's been doing so. Seventy five. Oh, we have to fight for it. Then there were new challenges with Rollins' intervention and, and, and he pressed on. And you know, all these years, we had always, between the two of us, been talking about how we could have the opportunity to develop this country into the real black star of Africa and join the nations of the Tigers of Asia and all that. <laughs> the policies that the government has been implementing are policies that do not find favor with the general mass of our people and that the mass of the people of this country have been systematically impoverished during the period of Rawlings' rule. Congress in Sunyani, Nana actually bid for the leadership of our party. So it's not only today that he's been trying, and um, it was unfortunate I mean, that he, 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 he lost. But in spite of losing, because of his love for the party and his principled political position, he was one of the biggest campaigners for Mr. J. Kufo. Unfortunately, uh, then the party came to power in 2000. The results of the 2012 presidential election as follows. John Dramani Mahama, NDC, 5,574,761. Nana Adodankwa Akufuadu. NPP 5,248,898 I declare John Dramani Mahama president elect We are taking our matter to the place where the constitution says we should take our matter we are taking it to the supreme court and we are going to put ourselves in the hands of the judges of the Supreme Court, and they will decide the fate of the Senate. In 2008, in 2012, in 2016, uh, especially the moments when we could not win, uh, 2008, 2012, and the petition in court. In all of those instances, you will find that uh, those uh, moments were difficult moments, without doubt, very difficult moments. But at the same time, you found a man who was resolute, who was steady, who was, if you want, if I may even say calm, and who offered leadership and direction for the party. And you will see that in all those elections, at every point in time, the MPP offered leadership and the MPP took a path which was in accord with the dictates of democratic principles. Nanado the politician was disappointed that the results as collated and declared in his view did not reflect the votes that had been cast. Nanado the Ghanaian the patriot knew that to get that resolved the important thing was to tell his supporters to go home 
the responsible thing for him to do was to gather the body of evidence that will make his case. The important thing to do was then to go to the courts to advance that case before the courts. And he did exactly that. You remember during his questioning, you did not immediately recognize the signature that he was drawing your attention to. You remember? You, yes, I do. You, you did not immediately recognize that. That's correct. And then, I've never been so flabbergasted in my life as to when the court ruled against him. He just sat in, sat in his study for a very short while, took his pen, took his paper, and wrote the most amazing speech, I think, of his lifetime. And went straight out to the lawn and delivered it. Whilst I disagree with the court's decision, I accept it. I accept that what the court says brings finality to the election dispute. We shall not be asking for a review of the verdict so we can all move on in the interest of our nation. When the judges ruled and about five of them disagreed and four agreed with his view, even that split decision, he was clear that even though he disagreed with what the cumulative count of the decision of the court was, every bone in his body as a patriot told him that he cannot do anything but accept what the courts were saying. And knowing the tension and the emotions that the country had gone through, he gave away his right to ask for a review of that case. And that's why he said he would not even be asking for it, even though at heart uh, he was of the view that maybe if we pushed a bit more through the appropriate forum, we will get um, a resolution. I see him not having moved from that position till today. Then I came back to Accra the next day when the announcement was made that we had lost. I went straight to him. I would never forget this. He was in his bedroom, so I just knocked, went in, and he was sitting there, as usual, reading his novels. He, he's a great reader, you know, he, he loves novels. And then he looks at me and says, oh, gee. So the people of this country wouldn't give me the opportunity for me to save them. It was, it was not because he's lost, but because he feels that he has a contribution to make to better the lives of this, of this country. I think his conduct um, during that dispute um, is worthy of emulation. Um, the fact that he accepted the, the result, the verdict of the, the, the court and actually called on his party and the supporters to accept the verdict uh, spoke volumes. Um, by that singular act, I think he helped to ensure um, the peace and stability, security of this nation. And I think that in doing that, painful as it was, it meant that he put aside his personal pain, he put aside the pain of the party and put the country first. And I think that that is um, really, that was really, uh, it showed a lot of statesmanship and it also helped to consolidate the credentials, the democratic credentials of Ghana. Obano was your father, the other Supreme Court was more Kano, then the Makolo, then so my who did it. My dear Tumsa, I'm so dear Tumsa, O man who won't ya. O man is here, Paul was a Magiato, was of any other. In terms of his humanity, there are very few people that I've met in my life. I mean, he is so kind. He's such a very generous person. Yes, very generous to the extent that he would give his last penny to the other person if it's necessary and for him to just starve. You know, he's, um, he, he has a very soft hand, as we say in Ipi, you know, and in Samogu. And uh, his generosity sometimes, I'm amazed. I mean, things that 
you think is very close to him, if somebody wants it, he'll give it away. Just so that the person feels, uh, you know, pleased with it, with their souls. And he has, he's one of the funniest people you can ever meet. He has a great sense of humor. He likes to talk and laugh. And when he's doing that, and then sometimes, uh, either any one of us, his aides or his friends, find the opportunity to pop in. It can be a lot of talk and laugh. He laughs a lot. Very easy man. He 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 laughs hard and loud. You know? Come on. Come on. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Generally, I'm, I'm a big believer in literature, mm. in history, love the arts. I'm very much into music, mm. popular music as well as more classical music. I listen. I came from the generation of Motown, so mm. I'm a firm uh, uh, fan of the Supremes, uh, and Temptations, yes. You have it all, uh, Teddy Prendergast and all of those people are very much a part of my So I listen a lot to music. I love cinema. In fact, there was a moment in my life that's what I wanted to do was to be a film director. I was assigned as director of the Office of the Minister for Foreign Affairs. And at that time, Nana Kufuado was the Minister for Foreign Affairs. So I was assigned to his office. When I reported, I think on the first day, he wanted to have some conversation with me. And um, I think he wanted to find out a bit about myself, my life, uh, what my views were, uh, my thoughts on the nation, the ministry. And so we had a conversation. And interestingly, before the conversation, he had been informed that I was, a, I was sympathetic to the NDC. I didn't know about that, so we had this conversation and by the time we finished, um, I had already told him how I make my political choices and I had indicated that my political choices were not actually based on any particular political party, but on who and what I thought would be good for Ghana. When we finished our conversation, in spite of that um, perception that he had gotten that I was uh, sympathetic to the NDC, he still decided that I should stay on as director of his office. And I was um, impressed by that because I thought he would probably listen to what had been said and feed on the perception but he, he still decided that he would take me on as the director of his office. I know him as a very sharp person, intellectually, uh, very deep, and uh, uh, he, he, he also uh, has a very wide-spanning memory, and he wants to have his hand on many things, economics, politics, uh, whatever. He's a perfectionist, Akufuado. Nana Akufuado believes that time is the best judge. Don't worry if some of your decisions look unpopular today. If they are the necessary decisions to make, make them. Time will prove you right. So he is not overly flustered by um, today's criticism of a decision that he's making. If he believes at the bottom of his heart that this is what is best in the interest of the country. The president doesn't hide his motions. I think people expect him to be politically correct and to pretend. He doesn't hide his emotions. If he's upset with you, nobody needs to tell you. He would tell you himself why he's upset with you. If he's excited with something you have done, he would tell you. Nobody needs to explain it um, uh, to you. But he has a big heart, a very big heart. He understands that sometimes people will make mistakes, um, uh, he won't hide it from you when you make that mistake, he'll let you know. He's berated me a number of times when I've gotten things wrong, tell you in the face. 
Um, and it also puts you in a position where you are also quick and always thinking, how do I get this right? Even at a point in time during his efforts to become president of Ghana, one of the problems that I, I, I saw his handlers have was getting him to pretend if you want. He's unable to pretend. Um, he's unable to be hypocritical. Um, you, you find him as you get him. The way you find him is the same person you will find tomorrow, tomorrow next day or night. Uh, he's a complete open book. Very straightforward, very forthright, and uh, very kind, let me put it that way. Extremely kind, kind-hearted, uh, but, but firm when he has to be. And what I find remarkable about him personally is I tell people all the time, that if you walk into the president's office and he doesn't confront you on anything or he doesn't query you on anything or he doesn't question you on anything, it simply means he has nothing against you. Because if he has anything on his chest, if he has anything on his mind, he meets you at a Craspot Stadium, he will, he will meet you with it. <laughs> he will meet you with it. That's the man um, we have as president. He's a very forthright, straightforward, candid man. So you're going to the campaign rally and you say, you say to Akufuero, pick up this child for the cameras. He won't do it. Unless, you know, I mean, he, he is, and he'll, he'll tell you Gabi is contrived. I said, no, no, but politics, a lot of it is, is contrived. You know, he's, he's too real sometimes for me, for a politician, if you ask me. You know, because you want him to, you want to stage manage him, he's not interested. You know, you know, but he will do things. So, so you just have to, if you're a cameraman, you have to be watching him and when he does it, then you capture it. But you can't say, no, no, do this for the cameras, you know? And he's too sincere for a politician, you know? But, but he's, um, and maybe, maybe for, he's too sincere for, the, for, the, for, the, for our perception of a politician, if you like. But, but that's the kind of politician that we want, you know? And if you, if you look at his political career, he's been consistent. The role model that has been guiding him is, is his grand uncle, J.B. Dankwa. Um, to the extent that there is this emotion, you know, it's as if J.B. Dankwa was his father. Nana tells me, of course, I, I wasn't there, <laughs> you know, uh, that our aunties and uncles all went to to, to JB, Grandpa JB, to say, look, go out of the country. They're going to kill you. Go out. I mean, you know, because a lot of them were going into exile at a time. And he, he wouldn't listen to them. And Nanadu was one of his favorites, really. I mean, if you've, you've seen, uh, there's a picture of JB Duncan, Nanadu was, was a page boy at his wedding. You know, so that's, that's how much he, he admired his, 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 his um, um, the, 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 the boy, if you like, um, the grandnephew, if you like. And so they sent Nanado. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to And Nanado went to speak to him. And he repeated what he said to, 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 to our uncles and aunties that look, if he has to, I don't know how to do you know? The other person um, that had a great impact on him during his youth, of course, was Kwame Nkrumah. Leonardo, at the time of the coup uh, 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 that dethroned Kwame Nkrumah, was actually speaking on a platform for Nkrumah. Uh, uh, he was the leader then of the Marxist Forum at Legon. And um, I remember that he, he ran home when he learned of the uh, uh, coup with uh, two different pairs of socks on. And my mother kept the socks for a very long time because she, <laughs> he, she literally was um, hid in their room for a couple of days. <laughs> I am determined to do all in my power to accomplish the tasks of the mandate and justify their confidence. 
I will not let you, the people of Ghana, down. He's a man in a hurry. He's a man who for several years has been dreaming a vision for this country, who has only eight years to do as much of that as possible, with limited resources, with a lot of people who don't really want to change. People vote for change, but sometimes don't want to change their own attitude. So in the midst of all of this, he is working hard and tough. Sometimes we are all worried about how hard he is on himself. He's not a young man, but from morning till dawn, he is working and traveling the length and breadth of this country on our roads, through our swamps, trying to deliver that vision that he has dreamt for so long. He's a hard taskmaster. He wants to lead by, by example. And he wants to understand everything so that when he is able to speak to everything. So in cabinet, he would have had briefings from the Minister of Education. If he disagrees, no, but you said this. Sometimes things that are happening on the blind side of some of us, because we don't have time to read all the cabinet documents. But he would have read everything and he's telling you that, no, 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 but this is wrong. Can you do it this way? Don't you think this is better than what you have done? This report that you have submitted. And then he'll go paragraph by paragraph with you to improve it for all of us. And I would say that his own cabinet meetings, really, uh, he demonstrated enough stamina. You attend cabinet meetings at 10, 11, and sometimes as late as 12 midnight, you are still there. Yeah. And he's there leading. Nothing stops us from being able to do so if we say to ourselves, yes, we can, and we can do it for ourselves. He leads by example, and so uh, he works tirelessly because there's a lot of work to be done. He came in saying that um, he was in a hurry and he was right. You look at the objectives that he has set himself, the vision that he has for the nation, and what needs to be done to achieve all of those things. It means there's a lot that has to be done. So he works tirelessly. Um, he's not lazy. He, he ensures that he leads by example. Yeah, he leads by example. And until he has achieved the target, he does not stop. He doesn't believe in something cannot be done. No, for as long as it is good for the nation, you must find the energy and the resources to do that. And that's the approach he brings. He believes the best of people. He, will, um, he, 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 he has a heart that also understands, appreciates where there are challenges, where there are difficulties. And he also strikes me, and, and I've known this in the years that we have worked together, he looks out for the interests of the poor, very much so. So um, any intervention that will help lift up, the, improve the standards uh, of the poor in our nation and uh, relieve them of the burdens that uh, the, the, the poor, the, he would certainly work for that kind of intervention. Yeah. And he's worked very hard. He's worked extremely hard. Um, I, I don't know, but I can't say he's, he's worked harder than any president in Ghanaian history, but he's worked very hard. I mean, he's been fully and totally dedicated to his job. Comes to the office very early in the morning, leaves the office almost midnight on a daily basis. Um, and I will say, even more importantly, very much on top of the machinery of government himself very much on top of the machinery of government. Many presidents will delegate to a fault. He delegates, of course, but at all material point in time, he has a grip on the machinery of government. and knows what is happening in almost every sector of, 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 of government's work. The cabinet system is very uh, important in his administration. It's very pivotal. The, the, the cabinet meets almost every two weeks. It is my job to protect you and I'm determined to do just that. I make a joke that God, God denied him 2008 and 2012 because he knew that he needed somebody like him to manage COVID-19 for Ghana during this period. And the reason is that 
This is something that the world did not necessarily plan for and the world did not have all the answers to. But I saw Nanado with my very eyes from the very beginning. One, assembling a team. Two, prodding through the questions that will help him even understand the nature of the beast or the enemy that we are fighting. And three, arrive at decisions on a daily basis, sometimes after heated exchanges between experts in the room. He's not a medical practitioner. He's a lawyer and a politician. And sometimes when you hear four different experts disagree on what must happen, and in the end he says, give me two hours and let me make a decision. You can only pray that he will get it right. But for all of these months, every week as he sits at the head of the table, listening to the doctors, epidemiologists, uh, researchers, people from Noguchi, international news, different perspectives, listening to all of them. Sometimes you ask yourself, how does one man end up taking these decisions that could mean life and death for hundreds of thousands of people? The times of COVID really brought the, the extraordinary leadership qualities in him. It, it, it brought it out. It, it, it made it so manifest because it, it takes leadership and, and it's very um, abstract. But, but really that's what it is. First of all, what did I observe? He chaired the task force himself. And that for me was very extraordinary. I mean, somebody will say the vice president should chair or the minister for health or the senior minister. But the president chaired, he continues to chair the task force to date. He chaired the tax force, and the tax force at a point in time met two, three times a day. And he sat in the chair. Oh, in those difficult times, in the times when, you know, the lockdown periods, when it, the, the, we had the, the, the cases going up and we had to take decisions one way or the other, he chaired the tax force himself. And I, for me, that's where we begin from, that he took charge of the management of the situation himself. I will be the last person to put the lives of the Akufuado graduates at risk. And Akufuado was one of the first, very first people, after asking all the questions, who made the argument that in those countries, when they lock down, they can send money to people through various means. In those countries, when they lock down, they can get food and water to the poor and the vulnerable and the homeless. Are you telling me that if we lock down in this country, we can do all of this here? Another key issue, and I, and, and I can almost see the stern look on his face as I play back in my mind, that are you suggesting to me that a lockdown on its own, without more, solves this problem? And the doctors, epidemiologists, professors, everybody was quiet. We went for one meeting one day, and there was a talk of lockdown. Some were advocating for total lockdown, some were advocating for partial lockdown, some said lockdown neighbors. Some said lockdown completely. You stay in your house. You only can come out to buy drugs. You can come out to buy food and so on and so forth. And the president posed the question. So if you say total lockdown, lock people in their homes, they can only come down, come out to hospital, come out to buy food, come out to buy drugs. There are people in Nima, there are people in Bukom, there are people in Saraki Zongo and the rest. How will they attend to nature's call? The room was totally quiet. I think it is in his ability to tease out the issues and ask the questions of a relevant team. When some persons heard, quite recently, when he was in the UK, one senior African leader asked him that, so are you sure there was no foreigner, no white man in your team? And Mr. President burst into laughter and said, my team is made up of Ghanaians. There's no white man on my team. Ghanaian professionals from across the field, health, public health, security, universities, um, you know, communication, etc., put them together, and the best can be found out of the African. And it is something that he's always believed in, the principle of self-determination, which he has brought to bear on this matter, and I think the results are showing. He believes he can contribute to the public good. And that Ghana can do well, and that a black nation, as he puts it, can also 
break the shackles of poverty, underdevelopment, deprivation, and the rest, and that we can do it, and that he has a lot to offer in realizing this dream and aspiration of the black people and of Ghana. And I think that is what has been driving him. I believe that in him, he finds in him the capacity and the wherewithal to be able to contribute as a leader towards the realization of this dream that uh, black people somewhere in the world, a black nation on earth, can also break through. Let us help ourselves. We are capable of building Ghana with our own resources, with our own skills, with our own strength. He, he has been our president in very difficult circumstances. Uh, we had to go through COVID last year, for which reason a number of programs had to be shelved. Um, it probably would have been a difficult, um, a different year, but for COVID. Um, but that did not make him lose sight of the vision that he had for the country. He has had challenges because of a real belief that some of the decisions he was taking were in the best interest of the country in the long term. As you look at the environment and how we are destroying the environment, some of these things, or even the, the clean up of the financial sector, these are things that in the long term would benefit us. In the short term, they come with challenges. Um, he didn't just look at votes. Uh, he, he kept saying, if you are just look, going to look at the votes that we need, there are certain important decisions that you will not take. Let us take what the decisions that will advance the overall interests of the nation. This certainly is not the time for politicking or the display of partisanship. The virus does not care which party you belong to. Neither is it, as we have seen, a respecter of persons. The enemy is the virus and not each other. He has a firm grip over everything that is happening. And I admire him for that. But he's human. And so um, he may also have his own faults, you know, um, because he doesn't suffer, uh, you know, laziness easily. He doesn't do that. So if you are a lazy person, it would be difficult to work with him. You know, that's the good father that I know. That's why I wish him and his government, our government, the best. I do not want to sound like a broken record, but it's important to restate what we mean by free senior high school so that no one has any lingering doubts. By senior, by free senior high school, we mean that in addition to tuition, which is already free, there will be no admission fees, no library fees, no science center fees, no computer lab fees, no examination fees, no utility fees. There will be free textbooks, free boarding, and free meals. The greatest legacy for now would be the institution of the free senior high school program and I, uh, which the impact may not be felt now but I think that as a country we haven't been able to achieve all our development objectives because of um, the level of education for most of the population. I think that um, the surest way to bring Ghana up, to bring lift Ghana up to the level where all the population can make informed choices and um, acquire knowledge that enables us to transform uh, economic and industrial fortunes so that everybody has a standard of living that, that, that makes the person comfortable. The only way we can do that, I think, is to ensure that we have an educated population. On President Akufuado's watch, you would notice that from agriculture to industry to services and their various subcategories, 
there's broad breadth growth. And if we're able to sustain this and keep growth at this average 7%, 7.5% growth for even a decade and a half. Look at China. When China wanted to move from where it was to where it is today, they had to be doing an average about 8% growth for a decade and more. That is the kind of legacy that President Akufuado wants to leave. That you find growth across board, growth that comes with jobs and incomes for people, average 7% there about it. And if you do that for a decade or more, my God. He's been talking about transformation for all these years, for 40 years, to transform this economy, to transform this economy into an industrial society. And that's why he comes up with this idea of one factory, uh, one, uh, 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 one district, one factory. You know, he has a passion that it will be the instrument to transform the, this country, to make the lives of Ghanaians far better and comparable to, in, to anywhere in the world. And to do that, the, what he believes in is that to, to prepare the ground for that big transformation, you need to have your agriculture right. And that one, I am totally on board with him because if you look at economic history, every country which has developed has done so through, well, at the first stage, the increasing agricultural productivity so that the farmers who form the majority of the labor force can have better uh, incomes and better living conditions and create the surpluses which will serve as an input for an industrial revolution. So I think that he's got those, uh, those sequences just right. For me, his legacy will be that he came and tackled some of the uh, systemic major issues of our country. And I've already mentioned some of them. Education, agriculture, governance, infrastructure development, modernizing our society, modernizing our economy, amongst others. I think his legacy will be that this is a president who took the oath of office, who from the very get-go um, made a very courageous, bold uh, intervention in all the productive sectors of our national life. And I believe when it's all said and done, uh, he will be remembered as a president who tackled education in Ghana. His breadth of knowledge from the Asian Tigers, from Europe, from wherever, from Africa, has allowed him to come to a certain big vision and his ability to persevere, uh, keep his determination and keep pounding on those key pillars which he believes must be achieved are a couple of things that anybody, be you in politics or not, I think needs to learn from him. There are also things that this country needs if we are going to really transform this country and make impact. Because if you don't have a leader who will persevere, no matter the pushback, no matter the temporary pain that sometimes we all think we are feeling. If you don't have a leader who has a clear big vision of where he wants to take us and will now work to push us there, then you would easily acquiesce and you would easily give up because the people say uh, X or Y or Z at a point in time. But those values which have spanned his political life, the last 30, 40 years of his active political life, which he demonstrates today, I believe are necessary to get Ghana beyond the cusp.